Welcome to our worship, Sunday, January 23rd, 2022. Welcome and glad that you are able to join in our service today. We're going to look at Luke this morning, chapter 4, beginning at verse 14 to 21, looking again at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, uh, this time from the perspective of Luke's gospel. So listen for God's word to you. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll to the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Amen. On Monday this week, we remembered as a nation a man who inspired all of us to live our Christian faith, to live as Christians in this world with Jesus' agenda as our agenda. No one in our nation's history has more powerfully called us to follow the cause of Christ who was anointed to bring good news to the poor to unchain the unjustly held captives, to aid those held back by disabilities, and to take the side of the oppressed peoples in our world. Thank God for Martin Luther King Jr., whose words and actions continue to call us to truly live into our faith as Jesus has set it out for us, to be genuine followers of Christ as we see him in this passage of scripture today. Last week, we enjoyed the spectacular way that Jesus began his public ministry in John's telling of the gospel. He began with a miraculous gift at a wedding party, supplying the guests with a lavish amount of excellent wine. And today... We are looking at Luke's account, and he tells a much more somber version of Jesus making his ministry public. In Luke's version, just like in John's gospel, Jesus has just been baptized by John the Baptist. But Luke tells us that first, Jesus is led into the wilderness, where for 40 days he is tempted by the devil. Rather than producing wine at a great celebration, Jesus himself is going hungry and thirsty in the wilderness. And then when he has finished those 40 days of temptation, Jesus goes to a synagogue meeting and he reads a scripture passage from the prophet Isaiah. He was only following the normal protocol of the meeting when he took that passage to read it. He reads it reverently, puts away the scrolls, sits down, and there is a period of silence apparently. And then, as people are waiting, anticipating what he might say, he makes an astounding announcement. All he says is basically, that scripture passage, you know the one I just read? That was all about me. Wow. Wow. That's quite a statement. The two stories of John's gospel and Luke's gospel are about as different as you can get. Now that does not mean that one is true and the other is made up, but 
John and Luke are simply remembering different moments in the early part of Jesus' public ministry that they find to be most, the most significant moment when Jesus first steps into that public, public life. Now, I love the splashy and joyful miracle at the wedding feast in John's Gospel. Who wouldn't? But I'm also intrigued by this more subtle, yet ground-shaking revelation in Luke. If you hear what Jesus claims about himself in this passage correctly, you should be hearing him say that he has just, in the reading of that word, he has just begun a new world order. Whoa. When you hear the phrase new world order, you may think of global power structures like the world's political powers, the United States and China and Russia, for example. You might also think of the super powerful multinational corporations of our world today, like Amazon, Google, Procter & Gamble, Pfizer, so many others. You might think of the bizarre conspiracy theories that people believe about a few elite people secretly pulling all the strings behind the scenes of the governments of the world. Now, those are those kinds of new world orders imagine people holding immense power to control people and resources either through politics, industry, or weird imaginary James Bond-like villains even. In contrast to all those images, we have in our story today the mundane context of Jesus, a poor local rabbi, traveling preacher, attending a small town Jewish synagogue meeting in a rural area of an overlooked nation that had no influence or power in the world of his day. The Herodian kings in Israel famously were ruthless and brutal, but they themselves were not really on the world scene very powerful people. They were puppets rather of, of the Roman emperor. Jesus was far from the center even of Israel's center of power in Jerusalem. He was very far from power in terms of the world stage in Rome, and Israel was merely a speck on that world stage. Nevertheless, Jesus, in that place, in that obscure little place, spoke a message that was earth-shaking in its magnitude. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Notice that every one of those statements is good news for the powerless, the overlooked, the oppressed, the people who are considered insignificant and disposable. Jesus is introducing a new world order where God favors the powerless. The world is turned upside down in that tiny remote synagogue so long ago. And as we watch still today, the powerful of the world desperately seeking to increase and hold on to their power, their wealth, their privilege, we remember now, we remember that God favors the poor, the oppressed, the blind, those held captive, or as Jesus described them in the Sermon on the Mount in a similar point, the meek, the peacemakers, those mourning for their loved ones, those hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the pure in heart, the persecuted folks, the poor in spirit. The Creator God, who holds power over all things, is not impressed by earthly powers or the powers of the people who are scrambling to control the world. God favors the people actually 
left behind by these power structures of our world. Jesus is not just repeating an ancient prophecy that longs for the day when the downtrodden are lifted up and the world is made right for those who have only received the bitter fruit of poverty. Jesus is saying that ancient prophecy, Isaiah's ancient prophecy, has just been fulfilled and he, he has come to make that world real. What we really need to hear in this message spoken by Jesus is that all spiritual life is deeply rooted in the way we, right now, the way we side with the poor, the oppressed, here and now. Christian faith is so often misunderstood <clears throat> as just a hope for a better world after this life is over. Now let me assure you that that hope is real, <clears throat> that God has promised that all will be made right one day. But that future hope does not mean that we don't bother trying to make this world look like the world we expect to come in God's kingdom. Instead, we live as we pray, and we pray as Jesus taught us, that God's will would be done on earth right now, as it is in heaven. That's not just a cheerful wish. That is a commitment on our part to be working toward that goal right here and right now with the people we meet every day. Are we committed to God's upside-down kingdom? Do we favor the poor who are being left behind in our economic systems? Do we favor the oppressed who are fleeing their own countries and trying to find a refuge where they can raise their families in safety? Do we favor the blind or the otherwise disabled members of our community who are often left out and ignored? Do we favor the falsely accused and the remorseful convict who needs a second chance, or the political prisoners of our world. When Jesus says, release the captives, I don't think that's just a general release of all captives. I don't think he is talking about someone like the man that was in our news this week, a Norwegian terrorist, Andres Brevik. If you remember 10 years ago how he killed 77 people, he had set off a car bomb, killing several in the town, and then he went to a camp and killed many more teenagers. It was a devastating attack, a terrorist within his own society. This week, that man started his appeal to the parole board because he's guaranteed a chance to every 10 years to a parole. He saluted into the air a Nazi salute, indicating that he has no remorse for what he had done. Jesus isn't talking about releasing all captives. He is talking about God's favor for those unjustly held captive as victims of a broken justice system or as oppressed political prisoners or as truly remorseful criminals who have served their sentence and sometimes served excessive sentences. But Jesus does indicate that God is on the side of those who are on the short end of the stick when it comes to justice, when it comes to poverty, when it comes to oppression, when it comes to uh, disabilities in life. So let us commit ourselves to faith that matters in the real world and not just to a faith that aspires to one day get ourselves into heaven. Let us see how Christ calls us to action as instruments of righteous change in this world here and now. Let us take hold of God's upside down values and trust that even through our humble efforts, even in a remote obscure maybe town like ours, 
God's kingdom can be unleashed. God's kingdom, his new world order is coming on earth just as it is in heaven. Let's be a part of it. Amen.